before. Um, so, give me a second. So, um, I am currently the director of security for First Look Media. Um, I don't expect many people to know what this is because it's quite new. Uh, you might know who these people are, um, and they are sort of two of the more famous journalists working for First Look Media. That's Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras. And they're mainly famous, I mean, they've done a lot of other things, I guess most recently famous for having received a bunch of documentation from this guy, um, who is Edward Snowden, um, which they've been sort of publishing on a, a media website called The Intercept. Um, I also work as a researcher for the Citizen Lab, uh, which is out of the University of Toronto. It's a kind of a think tank at the intersection of security, human rights, and digital media. Um, so it, it focuses a lot on measuring information controls, uh, sort of censorship, um, surveillance, and, and that sort of thing in, in sort of various countries around the world. Um, I also act as a special advisor to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the Freedom of Press Foundation that Runa works for, and a subsection of the United Nations, which I think is the Inter-Regional Crime and Justice Task Force or something. Um, <laughs> and so I also used to work for Google um, up until I joined First Look, which was about four months ago. Um, I spent a number of years there, and while I was there, I actually spent a lot of time worrying about risks to our high-risk um, users. Um, and so by high-risk users, I mean users that are sort of like more than averagely likely to be targeted and for whom the consequences of being targeted might be really, really bad. Um, and so in the course of sort of this role, um, I, I released this research uh, with a colleague of mine at, at Black Hat in Singapore earlier this year, um, where it was actually 21 out of the world's top 25 news organizations had been targeted by a, a state-sponsored actor. Um, and, I mean, that was the thing is that, you know, we, we were basically attempting to show how disproportionately targeted, for instance, journalists are. Um, now, this talk, I am going to talk about the, the types of actors that target journalists, but I, I kind of wanted to do a, a refresher on the classifications of, of threat actors so we can sort of have this conversation usefully. I am going to assume that most people here have had someone talk to them about threat modeling at some point. I'm also going to assume that this conversation was probably not useful and was kind of probably like the IT security equivalent of snake oil, right? It's like, oh, yeah, you've got to have a threat model, and then someone proceeds to drivel on about stuff, and they don't really actually know uh, what the useful threat actors are. For instance, I've heard lots of people talk about threat modeling um, and the NSA in the same sentence and things being NSA-proof. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to sort of ensure that we're, we're, we're all talking the same language. So I, I presume that a lot of people here, most of the people here have seen a diagram like this at some point. Is that, is that correct? Is everyone here familiar with the sort of Alice and Bob um, nomenclature for describing actors in a, in a cryptographic conversation? Like get a show of hands, yes, is that? Great, great. Um, so I don't really want to explain this again. So, so I mean, this is a, a very basic diagram, right? And you have Alice and Bob, who are two people that want to have a conversation. And Eve is the eavesdropper that is trying to intercept the conversation. Now, one of the things that we've learned is that on you know, digital lines, Eve is, is sort of omnipresent, right? Like, I think um, you know, it came up before the laws regarding that you know, Sweden is allowed to tap any communications that come in and out of the country. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about well, I think you know, a lot of people probably saw this one. Um, I, I was working at Google at the time. Uh, in this case, you know, the eavesdropper is the SSL editor removed here, and that was the NSA. Um, if you worked for Google at the time, which I did, you know, it kind of felt a little bit more like this. Um, but, and so, so Eve, um, as, as the eavesdropper, Eve, Eve does cost money, right? The infrastructure to run Eve is, is not necessarily cheap, right? Like, 
you have to put all these boxes and ISPs, fiber taps, that sort of thing. Uh, you have to you know, serve court orders to telecommunications companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But once this is all set up, for the, for the purposes of this argument, I'm going to postulate that Eve is, is free, right? Eve costs zero dollars, right? Like, Eve is just omnipresent. If you send clear text stuff over the internet, then, you know, you're having a conversation with Eve, who might be a very nice person, you know, uh, but possibly not. Um, however, you know, you've decided that you're going to get in on some of these sweet, sweet products that Runa was discussing. You're using secretly, which means you're totally fine. Um, and Eve is no longer your issue. Um, in which case, you're probably going to meet Eve's buddy. Um, and Eve, Eve's buddy is Mallory, um, which I've chosen to Tom Cruise from Mission Impossible to portray here. So, so Mallory is, is an active attacker, right? Um, and Mallory, in this case, does what you would probably understand as hacking, right? Um, this, this is someone who is prepared to uh, run probably what is described as a CNE operation against you, a computer network exploitation. They will attempt to exploit devices that you own in order to acquire a target. Um, and that actually costs a bit more, right? So, I mean, there's cost of developing a toolkit. There's risk that a toolkit will get burned during the operation. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the price of the zero-day market, and you know, maybe people are paying for it. If not, there's a development cost, so on and so forth. There are probably also, there may be individual lawyers involved, right? Like, in many countries, before deciding that they're going to compromise target, there may be, like, a roundtable discussion, much like any other business meeting where, you know, there is a lawyer present and people decide whether or not they're going to do this, whether or not it's legal, and whether or not it's worth it. Um, so, if Mallory doesn't work for some reason, right, like Mallory is unable to acquire the target, possibly because the target is actually exceptionally adept at um, securing themselves, possibly because the target is highly evasive. Um, then you will meet these people. And I don't actually mean Brad Pitt and George Clooney and the, the people in this movie. What I, what I wanted these people to portray was essentially like a black ops team, right? So, so the idea is, is that as you defend yourself better, you know, Eve turns into Mallory, and Mallory turns into a burglar. Like, essentially, if they can't compromise a the target, they will resort to seizing laptops, breaking into premises, physically exfiltrating data, breaking into your house, and that sort of thing, right? Um, now, this is, this is quite expensive, right? Like, this, this actually involves a physical team of people. Um, people don't scale as well as software. Um, you know, you, you actually have to, it's also risky, right? Like the risks of being caught, um, and, and the fact that, I mean, these people are, you know, government employees doing this at night, it costs overtime, you know. It's, it's, um, and, and this is kind of the ultimate extent of this. Now, I, I wasn't sure whether or not the TV series 24 was popular in Sweden or not. Um, do you guys know the TV series 24? Right, so I should have used the picture. So in my head, this is actually Jack Bauer, right? So like, you know, Jack Bauer is the guy in 24 who, as far as I can tell, basically just tortures people for like five seasons, right? Um, this, this is kind of the logical extent of this problem, right? Like if, if, if the eavesdropper doesn't work, if the active attacker doesn't work, if the, you know, the black ops squad doesn't work, then eventually, you know, you meet Jack Bauer in a chair um, and he just kind of slaps you until you tell him where the nukes are hidden or, or whatever it is. Um, now, now, this is actually really expensive because in, in theory it probably shouldn't happen, right? Um, and so the, the cost of Jack Bauer as well, I mean, gladly he doesn't scale, um, but, but I mean the cost of having someone like torture people and hidden in basements underground and that sort of thing is, is kind of like super expensive and there's kind of a, a political cost to that as well, which is worth a lot more than money, um, especially to really powerful people. Um, and so, these are the, 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 I mean, obviously this is a, a simplification, but these are the, the classifications of actors that, that we're going to think about. Like, so we, when you're actually thinking about threats, like, a lot of people talk about, like, raising the cost of surveillance or raising the cost of exploitation. And, and the idea is, is that if you have an actor with a lot of resources, that as you push it up this chain, they're going to get kind of 
bored or decide you're not worth it before it gets to deploying Jack Bauer, right? Like, that's, that's kind of where we're at. So it's kind of it's probably like a grimmer assessment, I think, than most people are really used to. Um, but but this, is, this, is, this is actually sort of in my head how this, this plays out. But, but now, that, now that you sort of know the, the, the classification scale that I'd be using, I want to talk a little bit about the, the actual actors. Um, so people have seen a lot of pictures like this, um, especially since 2010. Um, you know, there's the Mandiant APT1 report, which I think is a sort of a front page of the New York Times deal. It's been a lot of discussions about um, Chinese hacking and that sort of thing. This is quite a cool piece of graffiti by the British artist Banksy. Um, he is not the type of threat actor that I'm talking about, but this, this is allegedly supposed to portray the GCHQ. And this is, I think, somewhere in Cheltenham. Um, so, um, and obviously, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about these guys and whether or not you can be proof of them, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what I'm actually talking about here is um, sort of high-end intelligence agencies, right? Um, now, traditionally, we haven't known a lot about their capabilities. Um, we've learned a lot more over the last year, or there's been a lot more focus on it. Um, obviously, the Five Eyes, uh, US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, we have learned a lot about Israel's capabilities in this area, sort of post-Stuxnet. Um, it seems that they're rather good at this, um, and inventive even. Um, obviously, as I you know, said, China's sort of activities in this space have been probably more publicly documented in the English-speaking press than any other country. Um, Russia is obviously traditionally very good at this game. Um, I think it's France's capabilities were briefly documented in Le Monde and that there was like a, a slide in the Snowden archives from I think Canada, it was uh, something about GSEC where they actually mentioned that I think they'd caught French actors breaking into some Canadian properties, I don't exactly remember. Um, so I mean, like may maybe Sweden is on this list, but I haven't actually seen you know, much evidence of the, the Swedish intelligence capabilities. Like, can we get a comment on, no? Anyway, so, um, <laughs> So, so, I mean, th those are what I'd sort of call like, the, the, there's the sort of top tier actors, right? Like we've got well-funded Western nation state intelligence agencies. Um, the, this next classification I find particularly interesting. So this is, this is the commercial end of the market, right? Um, so there's an entire third party, um, third party surveillance and offensive tools industry. Um, now, out of, practice, uh, most of the people in this industry claim that they only sell to governments, military, and law enforcement, um, although from what I understand, and I'm not a lawyer, this is mainly custom, not legal requirement. Um, obviously, these people are prohibited from selling this type of gear to, I think probably like, at least in, in the US and parts of Europe, you're prohibited from selling stuff to North Korea, Syria, Iran, and in the case of US people, you can't sell stuff to Cuba. But mainly, you're kind of good to sell this to whoever you want to. Um, now, sort of most infamously, uh, there's a German company called FinFisher. Uh, they sell governmental IT intrusion and remote monitoring solutions. Um, a lot of information has come out about their business practices and products over the last few years. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's been shown that actually substantial parts of, of Europe use this software. Um, I think sort of Hungary, the Netherlands, Slovakia, Estonia, I mean, there's, there's sort of a long list. Um, Hacking Team is an Italian company that also sells what they would describe as sort of, you know, governmental intrusion products. Um, now, these, these types of products, because of their sort of um, legal nature, um, have disseminated quite widely, right? So these guys have made uh, quite a lot of money um, selling these products. Um, 
sort of rather liberally throughout the Middle East and somewhat contentiously to countries like Turkmenistan who have incredibly poor human rights records. Um, that's not to say that everyone who uses these products is bad or anything like that. Recently, communications between... So Australia, the New South Wales police uses this stuff. And recently, communications with the vendor and the New South Wales police revealed that the police were actually really, really concerned with not capturing the communications between the target and their lawyer. Um, which I was like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. Like, you know. Go you guys, try to do it right. Um, but, but I've done sort of like a bunch of mapping of the countries that, are t that, that use these type of technologies. So this was a map I made um, in April last year of countries that were using, were using FinFisher. Um, it's, it wasn't a complete map. This was made by scanning the entire internet several times during the course of which I was thrown off several different ISPs and, and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah. This is, this is a map of countries that we found to be using um, hacking team software. It's not a complete map because this is 21 countries that we were able to confirm. Um, hacking team, the company, actually claims in their promotional literature that they sell to like 60 countries. Um, so, I mean, the, the, this is the type of uh, capability that is being sold on the open market to countries that haven't had enough money or time or interest to develop boutique capabilities themselves, right? And so the idea is, is that you know, the Russias, the Israels, and that sort of thing, they, they've had very active technology industries. They have a lot of graduates in computer science. You hire them right out of university, and you get them to work on your offensive intelligence program. Um, whereas if you live in Azerbaijan, you probably don't have necessarily the rich pool of computer security professionals that you can draw on to write custom implants, write exploits, and that sort of thing for you. And so you go to surveillance fairs around the world and you, you just buy stuff. Um, you know, where there's supply, there's demand, and you know, these, 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 you know, it's good money to be made in this sort of thing. Uh, the sale of this sort of offensive capability isn't new. There's a lot of companies that do it, and there's a lot of companies that specifically really sell or contract to one government. Um, on the left-hand side, You've got you know, Raytheon, Harris, Mantic, and Northrop Grumman, which are all giant US military industrial complex companies that mostly sort of service the needs of the US government. Um, on the other side, you've got a list of rather small and bespoke, uh, rather, rather small companies, but they sort of do uh, bespoke offensive products um, for you know, customers unnamed. Um, you know, as I said, the, the, this mainly goes to law enforcement agencies, um, intelligence agencies, and countries which are not so high-end ones that I mentioned. Interestingly, some of this stuff goes to security companies and other actors, which takes me to this category. Um, so <laughs> these guys are actually a rather interesting pool of actors. Um, most famously, there's a company called Appen that operates out of India. Uh, now, I believe they, how do they phrase it? It's really nice. Uh, Runa wouldn't use this language because she's not in marketing, but um, they, they say that they offer like s ethical hackers for private investigative purposes. So basically, you pay them and they break into computers for you. Um, and, and so there's been sort of suggestion that they've done this, for instance, like say you have a court case and you want to know what opposing counsel is holding. You pay these guys, and they hack the legal company for you, and give them the, and give you their documents. Um, I mean, this is, the, in some cases, probably a highly desirable service, right? Um, there's another company called Leo Impact, which also provides, you know, these types of services. Um, I, they, they might not appreciate me calling them cyber mercenaries in case they watch this. Sorry, guys. I'm sure your business model is very legit. Um, but, but I mean, the, the, these sort of actors. Uh, um, Proliferating, um, I really can't comment on the legality of what they do, not being a lawyer. Um, but they are definitely probably, well, a step above sort of cyber criminals, which I guess has been a traditional concern for IT security for a really long time, right? Um, you know, we're talking ransomware and botnets, and um, I mean, there's sort of been a lot of, a lot of noise made about sort of, you know, the 
Russian, Ukrainian sort of cyber criminals and that sort of thing. And some of the software that they, they use is, is, is really sophisticated, right? Like it is, it is actually really good. There's a lot of money that these guys are making. There's a lot of money behind it. And I've, I've heard in some cases that they actually do get very physically nasty with people that are, are difficult. Um, now, the, the common thing between all of these guys, right, is, is that this, this, this type of calculation occurs um, when they're thinking about acquiring targets. Um, in the case of cyber criminals, it's, they probably wouldn't think of them as targets. I'm not, I'm not sure what the victim nomenclature is in, in that sort of um, end of the game. Um, but there's this sort of, you know, relative to resources that they have, relative to cost of target acquisition, uh, you sort of assess against target value and decide, you know, how much you, you, you want what they provide. Um, this is less true for the, this class of threat actor. Um, and I'm basically, these are black hat hackers of non-determinate allegiance. So this includes sort of anonymous um, hacktivist groups. Um, if you're unlucky enough to have just pissed off someone that's a black hat and that's good, um, you know, these groups, this, this type of actor traditionally um, isn't hacking for money, they're doing it either for fun, political ideology, or because it's highly personal and you piss them off, um, which is not so great for whoever's on the receiving end. Um, but yeah, the, the, these types of actors don't necessarily do that same sort of evaluation, um, and so we're just gonna ignore them. Um, as I said, for, 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 most, for most people, there's a sort of, um, cost of exploitation versus target value, but also there's sort of a reliability, right? Because you're, you want to do this over and over again, get the same quality result. Um, I mean, if, you're, if your business is in uh, the acquisition of targets, um, it, it means that probably in a digital age, you're actually all about the installation of software implants on some type of end user device, be it a laptop or a, a mobile phone, um, and, and in order to do that reliably, you probably don't want to spend a lot of time like phishing people or social engineering people, that sort of thing. I mean, you, that, that does work, and it actually does work reliably if you do it enough times, but it's sort of non-deterministic, and people, I think, get, especially uh, agencies that are motivated to care about security problems, um, there's sort of a diminishing returns the more you attempt those types of attacks. Um, obviously, the, the various categories and types of actors that I've described are not necessarily discreet. I mean, you get black hats selling exploits to cyber mercenaries and this sort of thing. Um, I say blended threat landscape, and I, I feel very buzzwordy, but that's sort of where we are right now. Um, what this has meant is, is that we, we've had like a, a real proliferation of the types of tools um, that, that are out there. Um, it's been shown that, as I mentioned before, countries like Turkmenistan um, have ended up using these tools. They have very poor human rights records. During the Arab Spring, there was a lot of brouhaha made about the fact that um, German and European countries were uh, selling these types of tools to countries that were in sort of active states of conflict. Um, so, so this has gotten re reported on a few times in a few different ways over the last few years. Uh, work that I've sort of been involved on, um, we sort of identified the use of Finn Fisher's product to target Bahrain Watch, which is a group whose job is to monitor the sale of arms to Bahrain. Um, and so that the, you know, uh, this German company sold uh, this, these tools to the Bahrain government who promptly used them to um, target and attack the largest international watchdog that was complaining about the company, <laughs> countries that were selling them weapons. Um, this guy is a human rights activist from the UAE. Um, he advocated democracy there, which is not a popular view with the ruling party. Um, these types of tools were used to compromise his computer. He also suffered not pleasant treatment at the hands of the government. This is the sort of the Jack Bauer end of the scale. Um, these guys um, are actually a US-based group. Uh, the Ethiopian government used tools purchased from Italian surveillance vendor to compromise them. Um, so, you know, this, you know, the, 
what we've seen, um, and I think what I've sort of tried to explain actually though, is, is that the, the concerns are kind of the same for, for actually both attackers and defenders, right? Like, um, there's a talk about sort of increasing the cost of surveillance, you know, increasing the cost for attackers and that sort of thing, but attackers are actually also into very, very into lowering the cost for themselves, um, especially if you're a professional attacker. Uh, it's, it's been, I think, well demonstrated that um, computer network exploitation, like you know, the cost of using zero day, uh, the cost of using implant malware, you know, the type of malware that you, know, you can use to turn on the microphone of someone's phone, the camera of someone's computer, and that sort of thing, is significantly cheaper than, than running a human operation of any sort, right? Like, it's, it's significantly cheaper to break into a company than it is to perform some sort of insider threat, right? Like, actually get someone to get a job at this company, and, um, and so if you are a professional attacker, how do, you, how do you leverage the assets that you've got in order to perform this type of exploitation reliably and cheaply all the time? Um, so, the answer is, is cute cats, um, which, which are sort of beloved to everybody. Um, I'm being somewhat glib, but what this is actually um, displays was um, there's a network injection appliance. Now, I'm presuming, does anyone in the audience Actually, that's probably not a good way to phrase it. Does everybody in the audience know what a man in the middle attack is? Show of hands. Right, this is really basic, well, it's a really well understood attack in IT security. Um, this sort of um, vector has been really, 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 really well understood for a really, really long time. As it turns out, if you own the wires in the ground um, and you can stick network injection appliances to perform man-in-the-middle attacks at ISPs, it's also still an incredibly efficient way of compromising users. Um, so basically, there's a few companies that sell these types of appliances. Finfishers is called Finfly ISPs. I think Hacking Team just calls this a network injector. And what occurs is at an internet exchange or an ISP, um, these racks of boxes are, are installed, and it's, it's actually an incredibly simple interface. Uh, you can just type in someone's name, and it, it uh, links to the ISP's radius records, and therefore they actually have the dynamic IP that's been assigned to you, or the static IP. Um, and then it just watches your traffic, and it, it waits for... Um, some form of clear text that actually can be injected into. So the, the YouTube video, the, the cat thing, was so, so YouTube actually, and they've fixed this since I reported it, but YouTube actually provided their video streams in clear text. Now this is because YouTube is one of the biggest websites in the world, and people watching cat videos actually comprise a significant and important portion of the internet's traffic. Um, but these clear text cat videos actually meant that through the use of these appliances, you could just inject malicious flash like into someone's stream before they, before they watch this video. Um, so in order to make this a little bit clearer, a friend of mine drew this like great stick figure diagram. Um, and so there's the sort of exploitation happens between you and the cat videos, right? And so, you know, here you are watching cat videos on YouTube. And at the other end, here is the servers full of cats, which is YouTube. Um, and then, you know, the cats travel across the internet towards you, and there is the person, the actor, who you can tell is bad because they have a sinister moustache and are, you know, plotting. Um, and and, and this, this actor with the sinister moustache injects the malware shown as by the skull and crossbones kitty in that box, um, and, you know, end user is infected. Uh, we have a screenshot of this actually being used. Oh, they didn't just... They don't just focus on YouTube, actually. They also exploit Microsoft's live service, because that also uh, passed, passed uh, it does no longer does, but this was also uh, clear text, as you can kind of see by the blurry box, which was http.login.live.com. Um, but yeah, this is actually a screenshot of the Bahrain government using it. Um, so this was a site which 
celebrated the anniversary of the February 14th, I think, protests in Bahrain. Um, so if you pay the right amount of cash, then you can silently install your surveillance implant on the end user's computer through the use of an exploit. If you decide that you do not want to deploy an exploit for whatever reason, you can just offer them a flash upgrade, which is what the Bahrain government has done in this case. Uh, these boxes or, or, or solutions uh, cost, that is shown in Swiss francs. Um, the on-site assembly in Turkmenistan was 43,000 Swiss francs, uh, but at 874,819 Swiss francs, I live in San Francisco, so I guess that's about 1 million US dollars, which is a nice round figure. Um, so, uh, there's, there's been, I guess, increased attention on the sale of technology like this to places like Turkmenistan, um, which has led to headlines that, like this, which I guess is good. I'm not convinced that this has been done in any particularly useful way, um, but, you know, I guess we'll take whatever we can get. Um, the, there's a lawsuit at the moment where the EFF is actually suing the Ethiopian government over um, hacking media company on US soil, because um, as it turns out, that is technically illegal under US law. Um, it remains to be seen whether or not that will actually bear fruit, because um, I'm not sure anyone has actually effectively sued a foreign government on behalf of the plaintiff for acts of espionage and actually gotten anywhere really useful. Um, <laughs> in terms of kind of, you know, I, I realize I sort of talked a lot about threats and the various types of threat actors that you're gonna come across, and the types of technologies they have to exploit you, and then you sort of come to the end of a talk like this, and so there's a sort of like, oh, I feel like I should come up with some sort of positive, you know, takeaway, what you should do, um, instead, I'm going to come up and sort of provide you with a negative, which is please don't try to ban cat videos on your network. Uh, like, that, obviously this problem is fixed already, but like, you know, YouTube isn't the problem or anything like that. The, the more serious thing though is, is I guess what I was trying to get at is, is that the problem with NSA proof, um, that assumes, for instance, that the NSA is the threat actor that you should be the most worried about. Um, for some people, this might be true. Uh, for some people in this room, um, for instance, if you work for a Swedish media organization and you happen to write an article criticizing the stances of the Chinese government on democracy, it becomes highly likely that Chinese APT is a problem that you should worry about. Um, if you're involved in high-profile business deals, um, then economic espionage from cyber mercenaries is definitely something, I mean, the, the idea is basically that you, you have an array of threats and a classification of actors, and until you actually understand those, you're actually not going to be able to usefully figure out who you should worry about and what you should do, and you'll probably end up using the terrible type of NSA-proof snake oil that Runa described before. Um, so this, the work that I sort of referenced in this was done by me and like a whole bunch of other people, so I'd like to thank them. And ah, questions.